Welcome to Kent Hans, the best storyteller in Texas podcast. Find us online at HansPodcast.com. Saying of the day, Betty Davis said, you'll never be happier than you expect. You want to change your happiness, change your expectation. I was reading uh, some articles on uh, musicians the other day and read one about little boy. He had to be the worst, have the worst luck of all time. His name was Adolf. He was born in Belgium. Wasn't Adolf Hitler. And when he was two, he was jumping on a bed and fell out a window. Window was open near the bed, and he jumped out the window. And they were on the second floor. Fractured his skull. Almost didn't make it. And then uh, when he was uh, six, somebody gave him something, and he got it mixed up with another item, and he ate acid. And then uh, when he was nine he fell down stairs broke his wrist when he was 11 he got hit in the head was in a coma for 20 days but his kids got bad luck and then uh when he was 14 he broke his arm and when he was 19 he was in a construction project and a brick fell off a scaffold hit him in the head i mean this, this guy is just uh raindrops falling on him at all points in time but he his goal was music always trying to find better ways to make better music and he came up with a horn and they call it name in accordance with his last name was sax the saxophone and uh, he was the expert and uh, there have been a lot of kenny g people like that that really play the saxophone play it well one of them was from Lubbock. He was really from Slayton, a little town outside of Lubbock. Bobby Keys. Bobby was famous, and uh, he had some uh, uh, internal problems when it came to his drinking. He consumed a lot, evidently. His dad was in the Army Air Base in Lubbock. His mother was 16 when he was born. They later moved to New Mexico. And uh, parents, uh, they thought he'd be better off with his grandparents from Slayton, so he stayed with his grandparents. And his mother later became a uh, state senator in uh, New Mexico, representing the area south of uh, Albuquerque. But Bobby Key started traveling with different performers, and he got his big break. The Beatles were playing in San Francisco, and they had a sax player who got sick and barely made it through the performance on Friday night. And uh, Saturday morning, they called Bobby Keys, who was uh, playing with some other people in uh, L.A., and he he got his saxophone and went straight to the airport and parked in short-term parking and flew to San Francisco and uh, played, and they loved it. And they said, just go with us. And so they took me, bought some clothes and everything. He was gone for six months. And in the six months, he came back to LAX. He went to get his car, and he got it. And he, he pulled up to check out in the short-term lot. And they told him what it, the bill was. And there was no one behind him. And he backed out far enough that he could open the door. And he opened the door and went in at the ticket booth and gave him the keys and said, you can have the car, and walked off. Just walked off with his saxophone and suitcase. And uh, that was Bobby Keys. He uh, was somebody that uh, played uh, with, uh, you know, uh, you name it. He played Johnny Cash, the Beatles, Eric Clapton, uh, just on and on with the top performers and uh, was very successful. Keith Richards. Rolling Stone was a good friend of his. Also, Bobby Keys was a best man at one of Mick Jagger's weddings. Uh, there were more than, he had, Mick Jagger had more than one best man. And uh, he and uh, Keith Richards had been drinking at the Beverly Hilton, Beverly Hills Hilton, and threw a TV out the 10th floor window because they didn't like some program. And uh, they got arrested on that, had to pay some fines, pay for the TV being fixed or, you know, replaced. 
Uh, I doubt you could fix a TV that was thrown out the 10th floor. Uh, he uh, died when he was 71. He had uh, cancer, liver cancer, and it, it was pretty short term. But he performed with all the big dogs. Uh, anyone that was anyone, they wanted uh, uh, Bobby to be playing the saxophone uh, because he was so good. And he got fired a lot also because he had get to drinking. And one time in Paris, he had uh, Dom Perignon, uh brought up, you know, in many, many bottles. And I had it put in the bathtub. And he and a uh, couple of ladies of the night uh, got in and drank and swam. And uh, that, that, that was her boy, Lubbock, that made good. And uh, he, he was quite a character. Somebody should have gone back and, and written a book on him uh, because he was talented and he was well-liked. People loved him. But uh, he would do a lot of unusual things, especially when he'd been drinking. Late this last week, Dick Butkus died. I want to just let them know that they've been hit. And when they get up, they don't have to look to see who was uh, that hit them. Shouldn't be any puzzle. When they come to, they got to say, well, it must have been Butkus that got me. Dick Butkus was much more than an intimidator. In just nine seasons, he forced 47 turnovers, including a then NFL record 25 fumble recoveries. His career was cut short by a broken down knee, but not before Butkus had played every down of football he possibly could. He stood for something just as important as victory. He gave everything he had on every play. He was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, linebacker in the history of the NFL. He was 80 been married 60 something years to his high school sweetheart and uh, was evidently a pretty good guy except when he was on the football field and when he came out as a senior Donnie Anderson from Texas Tech came out and Donnie Anderson got paid more of uh, being playing in skill position or running back receiver and uh, the first time that uh, the Green Bay Packers played the Bears uh, you know, he said that, that Butkus yelled at him, number one, number two is going to tear your head off. You know, that was the first play of the game he was yelling across the line. And uh, only played in the NFL until he was 31. His knees gave out of him. I think his knees are much like the knees of E.J. Hollip, who was also one of the great linebackers in the history of the NFL. He had had so many surgeries on his knee when he wear shorts. Uh, uh, people asked him if he got you know, a knife fight with a little person. And uh, I don't think they said it exactly that way, but he said that, uh, you know, it it, 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 it affected him. But uh, Dick Butkus passed away at age 80. Uh, everyone says he was a good man and fun to be around and, the Butkus Award is awarded to the top linebacker in uh, college football every year. So he's still recognized as the best. Uh, last week at the Phillies uh, playoff game, Bill F. Phillies were playing, and someone bought an entire section of free beer, and it was like $9,000. And uh, that uh, they, they wanted to be anonymous, and that they were, and I just uh, wonder if the credit card cleared. There was a guy that, that I'm, I've am i mentioned a couple times before that uh, was a custodian in law school at the University of Texas when I was there in law school. Got a call from him one time. It was on a Sunday evening, and he'd been locked up in LaGrange for an EWI. And, and uh, I went down there to get him with another law student. We got him, and we are driving back with, we're trying to figure out what happened. So what happened? He said, well, you know, it just, uh, uh, you know, I, I try to drink one beer every inning. And, uh, you know, nine beers is not good for you. But we were talking everything. He said something about the second game. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, it's a double hitter. 
you know, no wonder he got a DWI. He's bringing a beer every game, uh, I mean, every inning. Bringing a beer every inning, he's going to have some uh, uh, drinking problems. Uh, so we, we finally uh, had to help him plead guilty and ask for mercy. You know, there's time in life as a lawyer, you want justice, but there's times that uh, for your client, you want mercy. Uh, if you get justice, it won't be good for them. But uh, you have to ask for mercy. And, and we did in that one, ask for mercy. And just remember, friends, don't drink and drive. With this day of Uber and Lyft and all the, you know, help that you can get, you don't need to be out there hurting anyone's chances of getting home safe. Coming up tomorrow night is the uh, election for a new speaker. I'm telling you, you think about something that's messed up. I, I felt like they made a terrible mistake when uh, Kevin McCarthy, who is a good guy, when he made the decision that in the new rules that one person could call for ousting a vote, and, and you let one per any nut can come along, which happened, you know, and uh, we'll get you in a position that uh, you've got to, you're going to have to leave unless you can get all your votes, maybe some of the others. Well, the Democrats wanted to, they, they wanted to slow down anything Republicans were doing, and so they, they were all for it you know, ousting him. And uh, now you've got uh, Steve Scalise is running. Jim Jeff or is running. And uh, it. Uh, I, I predict that it'll probably be someone other than those two because I don't think they've got the uh, majority of the votes right now, either one of them. So tomorrow night uh, at the conference, when the Republican conference meets, they'll be trying to decide you know, who they're going to take. And uh, they'll they'll be looking at, uh, you know, Jim, and they'll be looking at, at uh, uh, Steve and trying to figure out which one would be best. Uh, Steve has been majority leader and has been very active. Jim's been chairman of the judiciary. So they, they both have credentials. Um, but if they don't get it done in the first or second round, I think somebody sitting on the sideline would have a chance. At it. Uh, Jody Arrington, the congressman from Lubbock, spent his name has been kicked around for that and majority leader. Uh, he is in a great position as chairman of budget committee, doing an excellent job. So I, I don't know if he'll try to uh, go up the ladder or not. Uh, we also have chairman of appropriations from Texas, K. Granger from Fort Worth, and uh, Roger Williams is chairman of the small business. Uh, committee, uh, which is very important. And then Michael uh, McCall is chairman of foreign relations. If if you ever get elected to Congress and you want to travel, get on foreign relations committee. I mean, they're gone all the time and uh, and they should be traveling. Uh, if you're going to be spending money in some other state, you need to see what it's for. Um, Pew Foundation did a survey and 63% of the public, they lack confidence in our political system. And 16% have confidence in what we're doing. And uh, it's uh, 4% said it's really doing well. So when only 4%, that's not good. But usually you'll see, if you ask a poll, do you think Congress is doing a good job? The, the vast majority of the public is always going to say no. And then they say, well, what about your congressman? Is he doing a good job? And they say, yeah, he's doing a good job. So they hear their congressman, they hear that argument, and they say, why can't everyone do that or believe that way? Uh, one, one thing that Madison did in the Madison Papers pointed out that you have there's give and take. Now, there's special interest groups, and they'll judge you on every vote you take. And they'll give you an A, B, C, D, F. And that if you vote with them a hundred times out of a hundred, you're going to get an A. And some of them, if you vote with them 99 out of a hundred, you get an F. If you just disagree on one thing, they go after you. And it's not it's not the way to government. Uh, you're you're going to win some, and you're going to lose some. But uh, we don't need to be in a position we can't even elect a speaker when you've got a war going on in uh, in Israel. 
Uh, so th this is a scary time internationally and that uh, public uh, sentiment is not good uh, in the nation. People are not happy with their political system. In the polls show they're equally unhappy with all three branches, whether it's executive, legislative, or the judiciary. They just don't think they're doing well. Now, part of that, I think, goes back to you having more cable TV stations. They've got to have somebody on at all times. So they're going to be criticizing everyone but themselves. And uh, and and they'll they'll be taking strong positions. Uh, if you uh, if you watch MSNBC or CNN, they're going to be to the left. They're going to be very liberal. Uh, Fox will be conservative, and that uh, that's you know that's just the way it is. One of the reasons the mainstream media is a uh, pretty liberal is they saw when Fox came on, people were conservative. And so they wanted to offset it, make sure both sides were told. So they made it very, you know, to the left. And if you ask one of them about it, they always swear up and down. Well, that's what everybody says, that we're not fair. But uh, I, I just say it, you, you have to look at it. If one of Trump's children had done everything Hunter Biden had done, do you think the press would have been quiet about it? And you know, and I know the answer. No, they would not. The pew poll also showed that people were upset at both political parties. Uh, in 2020, I was in the Lubbock Air Airport, and a woman yelled at me. She said, hey, Congress, Congress, and most of me, I went over to see her. She said, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, is that the best you could do? You know, I didn't select her. I'm not the one making decisions on that. I'm one of millions. And uh, but she she wanted somebody else, and that uh, you know people don't not necessarily agree, but if they don't participate in the primaries, you know they're losing their input. So I would encourage everyone to participate in the presidential primaries next year. Those saying that you shouldn't watch politics or sausage be made, I can understand that, but in politics. You've got to have thoughtful people, men and women, that sit down and try to work out the problem. Now, people that you see all the time on national TV, they're not known with their fellow members as workhorses. They're known as show horses. And that uh, they're out to get their name in the paper or on TV or whatever, and rather than trying to solve the problem. But I've been watching uh, some of the news about earmark and and everyone that goes on and say at Fox they're against earmarks. If you abolish earmarks, abolish it, fine with me. You don't save one tenth of one percent of the budget. It doesn't amount to anything. But if you want to do something about spending. Just slow down the calls or the adjustment or raises on Social Security or Medicare, Medicaid. Just say you can't spend more next year than you spent this year. And there are numbers there, but most of the members of Congress, they don't want to vote that because it might get voted out. I, I've always said that there are people in certain jobs, their job is to keep their job. That, that's, that's the whole thing that they do every day. How do I keep my job? You shouldn't be in Congress. That's the way you feel. Uh, you need to be there trying to solve problems, not just trying to keep your job. And uh, I'm hoping uh, that uh, new speaker can get some people to move forward and then get some things done. I, I know a lot of my fellow Republicans, they always say they're a Reagan Republican, and that's good, so am I. But Reagan knew how to cut deals and move forward. He is 30% across the tax cut, 30% uh, across the board tax cut. Uh, he settled on 25. You know, well, I mean, that's a lot. You know, so we're going to cut your taxes 25. The pure people, the ones, the true believers that don't believe in compromise, they'd say, don't vote for it. I only got 25%. You can go home and run for re reelection and say, well, you know, President Reagan sold you out. 
you only got 25% tax cut. Instead of going home and saying, he got you 25% tax cut, that's the largest in the history of the world. And it, uh, so it, it, it makes it difficult, but they, they have to, I think that they're afraid that they're going to get hit over one or two issues. And so it's almost impossible to get sick people uh, to compromise uh, on different objectives. Last late Friday and early Saturday, uh, Amos, uh, out of Palestine in the Gaza Strip, attacked Israelis. They went into town, took hostages. Uh, some of the hostages of women were raped. And uh, some of the men were killed, just uh, lynched. And uh, it it caught everyone by surprise, which uh, I find uh, very surprising that the Israelis didn't know about it and the Americans didn't know about it. And uh, you go back and say, well, is this because, you know, where did Hamas get that money? Well, you know, the Biden administration just approved uh, the Iranians to get six and a half billion back uh, that had been held, and that even though they may not have gotten it back yet, they still had the the wherewithal to move it around. And uh, so, you know, it it's uh, this could become you got to watch it closely, and that it doesn't become World War Three. Uh, it's it's a tough situation, and uh, Israel's not going to put up with it. Uh, they're going to come down hard on the Palestinian, and uh, they'll blow up a lot of buildings. They'll do some uh, bombing with their fighter planes and bombers. And uh, I've always said that had we subcontracted the Vietnam War to Israel, it would have been over in two weeks. Uh, they wouldn't put up any namby fan being trying to figure out what to do. Uh, they'd, they'd gone, you know, for an all-out win. Uh, so th- this this really needs to be watched. I got a call from some people that uh, their uh, a daughter uh, uh, is on a study group with Dallas Baptist and was in Jerusalem when this happened. So uh, a lot of people are nervous. They have relatives there. And this country, the United States, has had a lot of support for Israel and uh, that they have a democracy in that area. Here's the deal. That, that Hamas has done this in the past, but to a very small scale. Uh, but uh, these deals are financed by the Iranians, and they had unlimited sums of money to spend on it compared to what they used to have. The saying of the day, you'll never be happier than you expect. To change your happiness, you've got to change your expectations. Freddie Davis said that, I think it's a good one.